Ich begrüße ganz herzlich im Namen der Deutschen Psychoanalytischen Vereinigung die Rehustet bei uns hier in Kassel. Diese schöne Dame, sie ist nicht nur Künstlerin, sie ist nämlich auch Wissenschaftlerin. Sie hat ein Doktorat an der Columbia University. Sie lehrt Kunst, sie lehrt Literatur und ich habe sie kennengelernt in wissenschaftlichen Tagungen der Neuropsychoanalyse. Sie ist eine große Kennerin der Neuropsychoanalyse und der Psychoanalyse. I, Harriet Burden, also known as Harry to my old friends and select new friends, am 62. Not ancient, but well on my way to the end. And I have too much left to do before one of my aches turns out to be a tumor or loss of a name, dementia, or the errant truck leaps onto the sidewalk and flattens me against the wall, never to breathe again. Life is walking tiptoe over landmines. We never know what's coming, and if you want my opinion, we don't have a good grip on what's behind us either. But we sure as hell can spin a story about it and break our brains trying to get it right. Beginnings are riddles. Ma and da, the floating fetus, ab ovo. I was 26. He was 48. I was 6'2", he was 5'10". He was rich, I was poor. He told me my hair made me look like a person who had survived an electrocution and that I should do something about it. It was love and orgasms, many of them, in soft, damp sheets. It was a haircut, very short. It was marriage, my first, his second. It was talk. Painting, sculptures, photographs, and installations, and colors, a lot about colors. They stained us both, filling our insides. It was reading books aloud to each other and talking about them. He had a beautiful voice with a rasp in it from the cigarettes he could never quit smoking. It was babies I loved looking at, the little lords, sensuous delights of pudgy flesh and fluids. For at least three years, I was awash in milk and poop and piss and spit up and sweat and tears. It was paradise. It was exhausting. It was boring. It was sweet, exciting, and sometimes, curiously, very lonely. Maisie, maniacal narrator of life stream, the piping voice of boomin', buzzin', confusion. She still talks a lot, a lot, a lot. Ethan, child of method, first one foot, then the other, in a parquet square, the rhythmic ambulatory contemplation of the hallway. It was talks about the children late into the night and the smell of Felix, his faint cologne and herbal shampoo, his thin fingers on my back, my Modigliani. He turned my long, homely face into an artifact, jolie led. Nanny, so I could work and read, fat, Lucy and muscular Teresa. In the room I called my micro studio, I built tiny crooked houses with lots of writing on the walls, Cerebral, said Arthur Piggis, who once bothered to look. Gelatinous figures hovered near the ceiling, held up by nearly invisible wires. One gripped a sign that said, what are these strangers doing here? I did my writing there, the exclamations nobody read, the wildnesses, even Felix didn't understand. Felix to the airport his rows of suits in the closet, his ties and his deals, his collection. Felix the Cat, we await you in Berlin next week, madly, hotly, love, Alex and Sigrid. Inside pocket of the suit jacket on its way to the cleaners, his negligence, Rachel said, was a way to tell me about them without telling me. The secret life 
of Felix Lord. It could be a book or a play. Ethan, my author boy, could write it if he knew that his father had been in love with a couple for three years. Felix with the distant eyes. And hadn't I also loved his illegibility? Hadn't it drawn me in and seduced me the way he seduced the others, not with what was there, but with what was missing? First my father's death, then my mother's death, within a year of each other, and all the sick dreams, floods of them all night, every night, the flashes of teeth and bone and blood that leaked from under countless doors that took me down hallways into rooms I should have recognized but didn't. Time, how can I be so old? Where's little Harriet? What happened to the big ungainly frizz head who studied so hard? Only child of professor and wife, philosopher and helpmeet, wasp and Jew, wedded not always so blissfully on the Upper West Side, my left-leaning frugal parents whose only luxury was doting on me, their cause célèbre, their oversized hairy burden who disappointed them in some ways and not in others. Like Felix, my father dropped dead before noon. One morning in his study, after he had retrieved monadology from its home on the shelf across from his desk, his heart stopped beating. After that, my once noisy, bustling mother became quieter and quieter. I watched her dwindle. She seemed to shrink daily until I could hardly recognize the tiny figure in the hospital who in the end called out, not for her husband or for me, but for her mama over and over again. I was an agitated mourner for all three of them, a big, restless, pacing animal. Rachel says that no grief is simple, and I've discovered that my old friend, Dr. Rachel Briefman, is mostly right about the strange doings of the psyche. Psychoanalysis is her calling. And it's true that my first year of living without Felix was furious, vengeful, an implosion of misery about all I had done wrong and all I had wasted, a conundrum of hatred and love for us both. One afternoon, I threw away heaps of expensive clothes he had bought for me from Barney's and Bergdorf's. And poor Maisie, with her bulging belly, looked into the closet and blubbered about saving father's presence and how could I be so cruel, and I regretted the stupid act. I hid as much as I could from the children, the vodka that put me to sleep, the sense of unreality as I wandered among the rooms I knew so well, and a terrible hunger for something I couldn't name. I couldn't hide the vomiting. I ate, and the food came blasting up and out of me, splattering the toilet and walls. I couldn't stop it. When I think of it now, I can feel the smooth, cool surface of the toilet seat as I grip it, the gagging, wrenching paroxysms of throat and gut. I'm dying too, I thought, disappearing. Tests and more tests, doctors and more doctors, nothing to be found. Then the very last stop for the so-called functional ailment, for a possible conversion reaction, for a body that usurps speech, Rachel referred me to a psychiatrist psychoanalyst. I wept and talked and wept some more. Mother and father, the apartment on Riverside Drive, Cooper Union, my old and flattened ambitions, Felix and the children. What have I done? And then one afternoon at 3.10, just before the session ended, Dr. Fertig looked at me with his sad eyes, 
which must have seen so much sadness other than mine, no doubt so much sadness worse than mine, and said in a low but emphatic voice, there is still time to change things, Harriet. There is still time to change things. The vomiting disappeared. Don't let anyone say there aren't magic words. This is a very tiny segment from Rachel Briefman, the analyst and Harry's dear friend. After Harriet had Maisie, those passionate maternal emotions, as well as a zeal for order, seemed to take possession of her. She threw herself into motherhood and domesticity in a way that frankly startled me. She became her mother. Not so easy because she also desperately wanted to be her father, philosopher king. Harry and I used to meet every week for tea after she had seen her psychotherapist, a colleague of mine, Adam Fertig. One afternoon, she rushed in a few minutes late and apologizing, sat down opposite me. Rachel, she said, isn't it strange that we don't know who we are? I mean, we know so little about ourselves, it's shocking. We tell ourselves a story and we go along believing it and then it turns out it's the wrong story and we've lived the wrong life. This is back to Harriet, her notebook. What is early memory, I ask you? It is with considerable difficulty that I remember the original era of my being. All the events of that period appear confused and indistinct. Footnote, the opening sentence of chapter 11 of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Mine too. The mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven, Milton. Can I rely upon the pictures I see or are they reconfigured to a degree that obscures all sense? My life had stood a loaded gun, Emily Dickinson. I am wild on paper, I am bestial, and then I must hide and with the thick black crayon, I rub out every line, I blacken the page so they will never see what I have drawn, what I have done. Why do I feel there is a secret I carry in my body like an embryo, speechless and unformed, beyond knowing? And why do I feel it might erupt in a great blast if not checked? It must be easy, so easy to fill in that damp, throttling unease with words, to write the disturbance, to write a story, to explain the why of it. I was in my crib. I was standing on the floor. The curtains were drawn and I had to climb onto a chair to pull aside the fabric and look outside into the street. I saw his feet in front of the door. The memory begins to form itself from the cloud of unknowing. The shapeless takes shape and soon there is a smothered articulation, ominous and meaningful. Shame arrives before guilt. Okay, this is another person altogether, Ethan Lord. It's Harry's son. A dispatch from elsewhere. E wakes up to discover he is lying in his childhood bed at 1185 Park Avenue, a narrow white bed with head and footboard made of tall wooden slats. 
He wonders why he is not on North 11th Street. He knows he is no longer a child. He knows that he does not live in this apartment anymore. His dislocation perplexes him as he makes an attempt to sit up, but the sheets and covers resist him as if they were alive, and he punches the strangling bedclothes several times before he wrestles them off of him, leaps to his feet, and slides gracefully and without effort across the floor, down the hallway, and into the kitchen. E opens the cupboard to retrieve a number two coffee filter, but he cannot find it. His disappointment is acute. Then he notices that layers of dirt and large lumps of mold, oozing liquid and sprouting gigantic spores have grown inside the cabinet. He stares at the configuration of mycelium in the fungal forms and says aloud to himself that these white lines resemble a familiar face. But what face? He slams the door shut. He slams the door to shut out the mess. Then through the window on the far left side of his peripheral vision, he detects a flutter. Turning toward the stimulus, which he imagines for two or three milliseconds is a flag, E looks outside and sees a pair of long pants, a suit jacket, and a tie suspended horizontally in midair and noiselessly flapping in the wind. He notes that the suit's trousers are pointing due east. The suit pains him. Quickly, E opens the window, gathers up the disembodied suit in his arms, and brings the garments inside, all the while sensing that the clothes contain an unseen person and that he has rescued this invisible man from being blown away by the wind. E feels relief as he rocks the suit in his arms back and forth. He notices a piece of paper protruding slightly from the jacket pocket. As he looks more closely, he sees that the pocket is unusually large and it bulges outward. He pulls out the long white paper and reads a name, Sophus Bugge. Then, without any transition that he is conscious of, E finds himself no longer holding the suit but looking down at it and disturbingly it is no longer a suit. It seems to have produced a fringe of ruffles and on the whole developed a flimsy, diaphanous quality that had not been part of it before. It looks suspicious. As he stares at the transformed suit, he feels more and more irritated and is convinced that he has mislaid or forgotten something important. Just as he asks himself what that thing might be, the article of clothing begins to jerk upward as if there is an animal underneath it. Terrified, he opens his mouth to cry out and he wakes up, his heart beating. He is back in his apartment in Williamsburg on North 11th Street and the morning sunlight has come through the cracks in the blinds. E's heartbeat slows. He doesn't stir, but reviews the dream in his mind. He is working on dream material for his fiction. He knows that if he acts too quickly, the dream will evaporate. He knows he must rehearse the dream rooms in his mind. The actual Park Avenue apartment and the dream Park Avenue apartment are not identical, but they have common traits. After coffee and a slice of pizza, he finds wrapped in tinfoil on the second shelf in his refrigerator. E types the above version of the dream to study it. He also picks up the book he was reading the evening before, Jesuit Reports on Indian Missions in New France, 1637-1653, and finds the following passage he has underlined. In 1648, Father Paul Ragano wrote, quote, the Hurons believe that our soul has desire other than our conscious ones that are both natural and hidden, made known to us through our dreams, which are its language. 
E remembers that before he went to sleep, he was reading another Jesuit priest's report, which described the Hurons' ritual enactments of dream narratives during the day, performed so that the soul's hunger can be satisfied. The priest related that one day he found a man rummaging wildly through his camp, throwing objects in what appeared to be a desperate search for some object. When the priest asked the man what he was doing, he answered that he had killed a Frenchman in a dream and was looking for some object to appease his soul. The priest gave the man a coat, telling him it had belonged to a now deceased Frenchman. The offering calmed the man, and he went on his way. He asks himself if this story is the origin of his own dream's flying coat. E isolates the dream elements to propose possible soulful interpretations. Place. E's old bed in the old apartment, where E spent his childhood and adolescence, and which he visited during his early adulthood. Domain of mostly silent parental struggles. Strangling bedclothes. Why strangling? Possible reference to a sense of oppression felt by E in a household while growing up and to E's childhood tantrums and later his panics during which he felt he could not breathe. Every once in a while, E still feels threat of breathlessness and carries around two lorazepam in his wallet just in case. Suit of clothes suspended in midair outside kitchen window. E's father suffered a stroke at the table in the breakfast nook at 1185 Park Avenue as he sat near the window. Therefore, E has dreamed about the window and the suit flying outside it, dreamed of a bodiless man in exile. Death is exile from the body, exile from everything E thinks. Neither E nor his sister M were present when their father was struck down by the cerebrovascular accident. Their mother was present. She rode in the ambulance. When E and M arrived at emergency on 68th Street, the emergency was over. Emergency ends with either life or death. Schrodinger's cat doesn't exist in the world. E knows. Life and death do not coexist in a single body. E remembers the words aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. He remembers the tan colored plastic seat in the waiting room and the zigzag ink mark beside his thigh as he sat on it. He remembers he did not want anyone to touch him. Flying due east, awake. E solves this puzzle easily. Thailand is an eastern country E's father's maternal roots are due east. The legs point toward his grandmother, toward Kunya, with her bright red hard fingernails and big smile. E rescues clothes that seem to contain someone, but that someone cannot be seen. E's dead father cannot be seen anymore. Does the son want to rescue what is left of his father that is in danger of being blown away? What would that be? E has rejected his father's money except for a modest annual amount, but he knows he is a hypocrite. He should become a welder and write at night. He has looked into learning to weld. He has even re received brochures in the mail from Apex Technical School, but he never pursued the training. He is a soft, coddled Philistine who will never become a welder. Does he in fact want to hold on to his father's legacy, to his money, suits, art collection, and every other bourgeois trap imaginable? E did not cry after his father died. He has wondered many times why he did not cry. He remembers the clothes in his arms and the dream and the feelings of relief, sadness, and pity that were far stronger in the land of Nod than in the land of Awake. One small last section. This is when Harriet Burden is dying. She keeps a notebook. March 5th, 2004. I have come home 
to die. But dying is not so simple in this our 21st century world. It takes a team. It takes pain management. It takes hospice at home. But I have been strict with them. This is my death, not yours. I said to the goddamned social worker who oozed compassion when we planned the final step to die well. An oxymoron, you idiot. I said no to the grief counselors with their sympathetic faces peddling denial and anger and bargaining and depression and acceptance. I said no to professional mourners of all kinds and their goddamned cliches. I will have no simpering crap uttered within 10 miles of my deathbed. I boomed these words. I was magnificent. <laughs> the boom has left me. I am a leaky vessel, urine and feces and tears ooze from me without permission. I have diapers that must be changed. My bowels, ruined by surgery, are twisted again with tumors. My hair has grown back straight. The frizzy hair I detested and then learned to love is gone, and in its place, lank gray straw has grown. I am truly a monster now, ashamed of its hideous body. I smell piss, shit, and some other unknown odor no one else admits to smelling, but it must be the stench of dying. I smell it as I write this, wafting up from the war zone below the sheets. I should be bathed in bleach. I am lying in my special bed that goes up and down at the press of a button parked by the window so I can look onto the water and gaze at Manhattan across the way. I miss the world I am leaving, but I have not forgiven it. Its bitter taste remains a hard crust in my mouth I can't spit out. Pearl is looking over my shoulder to see what I am writing. She is all efficiency, a sharp one. Born in Trinidad, lived in Sweden, now in NYC. Private nurse, speak to me in Swedish, I say, and she does. I would like to retrieve the mind I had, the one that leapt and did jigs and somersaults in the air. I used to want them to see it, to recognize my gifts. Now I would settle for just having it back. Thank you so much, Siri. Because just this last sequence was touching me very much. I mean, how can we find word for dying? And I think this is you as a writer, you can it. And when you read it, then it has still another non-verbal communication with us. When I read it without hearing you, I was uh, so much um, touched by the anger and despair of this woman, you know. Yeah. And uh, you didn't read this uh, uh, sequence when she she tells her little yeah the granddaughter the granddaughter yeah. she says Ch you should say it in English. Uh, what, what does she say? I mean, she says, "Don't let them uh, push you around." Push you down. Yeah. Let's, let, uh, she, so she still gives her a message to yeah. be a rebellion. Yeah. And of course, you know, we have 
patients in treatment during a process of dying and we often don't find the words. But theoretically we hope that uh, that comes over what you kind of communicated, at least to me, that it is not only rebellion, despair, but it could be also some kind of mourning. Yes, yes. Well, of course, there are 20 voices in, in this book. You heard um, just a few of them. And the central voice is a voice driven by rage. And I have to say that Harriet Burden, for me, is, of course, a, a, a character. And to some degree, this is a realist novel. At the same time, um, I thought of her in terms of both myth and tragedy. So unlike, uh, for example, a lot of angry people who are also depressed, she's not at all depressed. Mm -hmm. She has the kind of pure uh, emotion of rage as in uh, Greek tragedies. You know, at one point she says, I am Medea, yeah. the image of their fear. So um, it was a lot of fun, actually, writing her. Soll ich etwas übersetzen oder verstehen Sie das alle? Soll ich so ein bisschen übersetzen? Nein. No, glaub, pretty good. Ist, okay. Sie redet so schönes Englisch. Ich glaube, das versteht man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think Medea was kind of a, a, a figure which came to my mind. Yes. Also. Yeah, so, so, you know, that's the, um, I think it was um, uh, Peter Brook, the great theater director, who said that what he looked for in his theater productions um, was the closeness of the everyday and the distance of myth. And then he said, because without the closeness, you can't be moved and without the distance, you can't be amazed. Mm. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> and, and so there's something of this, these two aspects that are part of the narrative. Mm. Mm. It's interesting that we had in, in our discussion at this conference, we had uh, an exchange with a philosopher from Zurich, Michael Hampe, and he said that the closeness of psychoanalysis to myth and to dreams uh, made, uh, gave us a lot of troubles as a science and the acceptance in the scientific world because already at Freud's times, going back to myths or going back to dreams that was just not scientific. Right, right. And it's strange for us, I think, that is not something kind of new I'm saying, but the closeness of literature, of art, to psychoanalysis is just there. Yeah, I mean, I think these things are interesting. Of course, what you find out more and more, actually, for reasons that... Um, for a book that I've nearly finished, but I am reading about the physics of time. And what you begin to understand is how we divide up knowledge so that these physicists who are writing for lay people like myself, describing the various theories of time, there is no uh, absolute certain theory of time, uh, completely, of course, necessarily ignore the particular. In other words, the phenomenology of our existence is not part of physics necessarily, you know, which doesn't mean that the laws of physics don't apply to everything. But you see this all the time, that you parse out parts of experience depending on the discipline that you're in. And my long-standing attraction to psychoanalysis is that Freud, of course, provided a model, or maybe we should say models of the mind over the period of his career. Um, he was, as we all know, deeply rooted in the natural sciences. He was a neurologist. You know, he did a lot of work with crayfish mm -hmm. and neurons. 
uh, and I think he hoped to solve the mind-body problem in the project. Uh, but then he moved on from there. But he always talked about psychoanalysis as, as a biological uh, uh, psychology. So it was rooted in the, bi in, in the biological for him always, even if that biology remained to be understood. And uh, the genius, I think, of psychoanalysis is, of course, that it seeks to combine the subjective reality of a particular life with a kind of frame or model for the mind that makes sense. And there are very few things that do that. Mm -hmm. And of course, it remains a tension. It remains a struggling, you know, because uh, the understanding, the unconscious, I mean, you have understood by writing, you communicated a lot of understanding of these persons you are creating, creating in your mind to us. But as a, an analyst, it's a little bit a similar, but a little bit a different situation also. Well, you know, it's funny because actually rereading uh, Ethan's dream, uh, <laughs> you know, Ethan is withheld. Uh, he, 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 needs, he needs frames and patterns for him to feel comfortable in the world. And you realize that he's a, a very intelligent young man and he's certainly figured out part of this dream. And I have to say that, you know, I just, the dream just kind of came to me. I wasn't plotting out a dream to be deciphered. I did the dream and then I deciphered it through Ethan. And then of course you realize, you know, all this stuff that Ethan, and I, I was aware of that, all the stuff about the dream that Ethan is suppressing, which is of course, the feminine ruffles, you know, that the suit turns into this female nightgown almost with an animal underneath it. And, you know, the phallic imagery of the pocket, <laughs> you know, the, both the phallic and the vaginal imagery of the pocket, you know, with something in it. Um, but, you know, he misses all this. This is not, this is exactly what he cannot think about. So... It was kind of amusing to be reminded of that. And then that wonderful stuff about the Hurons, the Indian culture, of course, which also talked about the meanings of dreams. And it was deeply part of, of, of the culture. So it's always interesting to return to uh, all, there are many of them, pre-Freudian models for the dreams that signify. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think what Hampe says, of, I, I probably it could be, you know, we live in this zeitgeist of evidence-based medicine and everything has to be measured. And of course, we have the problem that if we want in Germany that the insurance companies pay for our treatments, we have to show them that it works. Right. But it's not that what really interests us as a, as a psychoanalyst. It's, for instance, dreams. Right. You know, how dreams change in the course of a, of a treatment. And I, I asked myself a simple question. Is it ironic that he makes this? I mean, it's like a lecture in psychoanalysis for candidates, <laughs> you know, taking the elements <laughs> and look at the... Yeah, well, I think this is, you know, Ethan's personality. His mother would never right like that, right? And neither would his sister. So when I was working on the book, for me, it was a strange and wonderful experience, but it was becoming these people. And I thought, you know, it, there is a, f it's very similar to what actors do, mm -hmm. you know, especially method actors, that they find a personality and once you found the personality then they have very different voices and they have different cadences different rhythms and different ways of structuring what they're doing so for Ethan it's typical that you know he would it's almost like you know numbering the points mm -hmm. I actually by the way I do that in if I'm lecturing um 
in science or philosophy. And you know, there are always questions afterwards and sometimes they're very hostile, which is part of the game. It actually can be really fun. Um, I always number my points. <laughs> One, two, three. <laughs> Thank you so much for your question. One, two, it's very effective. <laughs> Please don't ask me to ask you one, two, or three. <laughs> no, but you know, it's again, it's, you know, different environments call for different responses. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to do that with psychoanalysts. <laughs> oh, maybe you should. Can you tell of one, two, three what you have to say to us? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> no. no, but to go back, uh, of course, um, it is a gift. Your novel is a gift to us as psychoanalysts because oh, maybe I should just show you one passage which really touched me. I speak to Dr. F on the phone. I can hear sorrow in his voice. It is love. I am grateful for that strange form of intimacy, for the one-way telling. He has known me better than anyone. Strange, but true. I have been in psychoanalytically based psychotherapy twice a week for six years. And um, it's interesting about, you know, what you're talking about, evidence-based. And, and actually, I think it's really good that all of this goes forward because we live in the world that we live in. And it's important to show uh, that these, this, this long particular form of dialogue has significant effects. And many, there are many, many people, including myself, who can testify to the fact that it works. And um, that I have never felt so free in my life as I do now. And I think this is, you know, it's important to say it. Mm. You know, a lot of people are embarrassed. I'm giving a lecture in Munich on Louise Bourgeois. Mm. And Louis, the, the great French and then American artist, mm. there's a, a exhibition of her cells at the Haus der Kunst. Mm. And uh, <laughs> Louise Bourgeois was asked in 1992 she was in quite an old lady, by someone, you seem so interested in psychoanalysis. Uh, have, did you, have you ever been in therapy yourself? And Bourgeois says, no. 30 years she was in analysis. <laughs> <laughs> she was in analysis for 30 years, and she didn't leave the analysis until her analyst died. <laughs> so... Using her as, as an anti-example, and listen, I completely support Louise Bourgeois, you know, she could say whatever she wants to a journalist, you know, you don't have to tell journalists a goddamn thing. <laughs> but, but it's interesting that for her, that was something that she wanted to hide. And I think it's very important that that is not hidden. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. for me as a human being and in relation to the world. Well, we are very grateful, as you know, the zeitgeist is not so much in favor of us because we are a kind of a crazy thing. I mean, you, you think what you think, you know. What is it? I think it's right. It has something to do with love. But I couldn't tell my people from the insurance companies, please, I love my patients. Please give me money. I mean, he would, no. they would think it doesn't it's, work. It, no, it doesn't work. But I think you know the, the the relationship between psychoanalysis and art, which is very interesting, mm -hmm. is of course in the psychoanalytic space, there is a real other. Mm -hmm. I mean, that other is also a fantasy other because you know there's, as you know, in the transference, there are all kinds of uh, um, projections, if you will that happen, and then the counter-transference. But what's, f what's fascinating about it is that Freud seems to have invented a remarkable idea of a safe 
container or a safe room for this particular kind of dialogue to take place. And that is a pretty radical invention. I mean, there are things that went before. Uh, Pierre Janet, mm -hmm. uh, the really great neurologist and philosopher, did work with his patients in similar ways. He knew that establishing a, 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 a safe relationship, getting them to talk and or write was important, but it was codified by Freud. And I think, interestingly enough, in making a work of art, especially a work of art which takes the artist or the writer to dangerous places, and I consider this book to have been an exploration of certain dangerous places for me, dangerous voices, uh, is that the aesthetic frame provides that safety. That's why novelists don't have multiple personality disorder. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the novel is a kind of fragmentation of the self. Mm -hmm. But you need that safe place. And that safe place is the form of the novel itself, which Ernst Chris called an aesthetic uh, barrier. I like the word frame because it's like, well, it's a little like Bean's container. Mm -hmm. Um, a holding, or the holding en environment of Winnicott. Mm -hmm. And of course, a discussion about the setting. You know, we have persons with multiple personality disorder, and that is when reading your novel, I ask myself all the time, my God, how constructivistic can you be? Where it, is it really so that you can invent yourself as... Harriet does all the time. We didn't right. talk about the gender problem yet. But, I mean, seeing patients in this psychoanalytic setting who really don't know anymore who they are, yeah. that is a very dangerous and scaring thing. And I think even we have talked in this conference about it. You need also to frame the setting in order to be able to contain Yes. And to stand that you don't know what is happening for a long time. Yeah. And that is so brilliant that you give it in a, in a different world, in, in, in literature, you are kind of describing, at least for me, some similar processes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, they are related processes, which is why it's not a complete joke. I mean, Virginia Woolf, in one of her essays, talks about... Uh, the multiple selves, you know, how we all have these internal dialogues and she, you know, they all pop out and they're having these, uh, conversa this conversation. And then she says, and then I called all my selves back. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I think this is what the novelist does in some way. They're all out there. It can be a bit harrowing, very emotionally draining, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, the artist or the lucky artist can call them back. And the lucky analyst can call them back. Yes, <laughs> and the lucky analyst can yeah. call them back. Yes. <laughs> I yeah. have now uh, an open question. I mean, maybe you would like to ask some question. We are a very large group. I think we could try if someone can ask you a question and... If that doesn't work, we just continue to talk okay. among ourselves. Is someone you can here? You can probably you can ask in German. If I have any trouble with the German, then I can get the translation. So you don't have to feel that you have to stand up and, and ask in English. There is someone. I don't... Why hear. did I call my... Oh. <laughs> Every... Every character in this book, every single one, has a kind of symbolic name. And I was so pleased when I came on Harry or Harriet Burden because she is bearing multiple burdens. And uh, the burdens are connected to uh, a, a sociological burden. I don't know, have you read the book? No. Okay, so just inside the book, the three male masks show three works of art. 
The first is a kind of uh, uh, huge nude woman covered with works of art from the history of Western art. And I always thought about that's like the sociological, cultural part of the, uh, the story, which is that, you know, women have been left out of art history. The second is uh, a work that she does with another mask, someone she likes very much, they're friends, they get along together. And it's a little hermaphroditic creature climbing out of a box in a narrative sequence of seven kitchens that get hotter and hotter. <laughs> anyway, and there are these two big parental figures. And I always thought this is Harry's psychic burden, right? So the first is the sociological burden of just being female. The second is her psychic burden with her parents, her complex relation with her parents, especially her father from whom she wanted so much recognition and she didn't get it. And that is also then for her projected onto the culture. And the third is a maze, the piece that's called Beneath. And you, the spectator literally walks in and the only way you can get out of the maze is to pay very, very close attention to these little boxes and windows and holes inside the maze. And that for me was doubling both as the illegibility of our unconscious life and a model for the novel as a whole, which is that if you don't pay attention, you won't get out of the book. The English is not so easy. I, I, I realized that when I was writing it, and um, it, you're absolutely right. For me, this is um, very much, was written as a, a, a work of rhythms and cadences, and uh, finding those voices through this bodily sense. I mean, who knows what all this is about, but. That was it, and um, and of course there is a a theme in the book of the mind body problem too, uh, but Harriet is very much a figure of both the body and the mind, and I wanted her to explode that division that we're constantly making uh, in the culture, but the music is so I think of this book as. A, uh, musically orchestrated uh, work and when I was writing it the way I would get to a point and then I would read the whole book up to where I was and if I felt there was something wrong with the music you know not just the whole rhythm of the book but really these shifts then I would throw away what I had been doing and start over um, and Okay, there's another thing. It's interesting, a book like this, there were, I mean, there were many people who really liked this book and admired the, you know, complexity of it and, uh, you know, the, the knowledge in it. But it's really an emotional ride, this book. And many years ago, I came on a, a thought that's a little funny, but it's also serious, which is art is like sex. If you don't relax, you won't enjoy it. <laughs> and this is, I discovered this actually with Thomas Mann when I was, I think, eight, you know, I was like 17 and I was hungry to read all the great works. And so I was desperate to read The Magic Mountain. And I started it and I thought, oh, what are these guys? They're talking and talking. So it's all this stuff that I don't know, and oh God. And so I put it away. And then I started it again and it didn't work. And then I think when I was 19 or 20, I said to myself, Oh, to heck with it. Just relax. If you don't get all of it, who cares? And I read it during the summer. I just loved it. <laughs> and you know, I can still remember the, the smells. You know, 
up in the mountain at the clinic, I can see the hallways. These are obviously images yes. I made, you know, and I can see the, the x-rays. You know, it, it, this is how the book returns to me. And the same thing happened with Joyce, who I was also in a big hurry to read as a young person. Oh, my God, I thought I haven't even read Homer yet. How am I going to read James Joyce? I was so nervous about the <laughs> classics. And I did the same thing. It's wonderful, but I think the suggestion... <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean yeah, this. But the success, I don't know if that's silly, but it would be so... I had exactly the same experience as Joachim. I have read the book, but it is such a different experience when you hear your voice with it. And you don't get fragmented. You feel you can hear the music. The differences, the differences. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the German translation is not bad. But I started to read it loud. And right, it right. helped a bit, but, but, but it's so complex. And of course, all these footnotes and this philosopher and this knowledge and so. Mm. So uh, it would be great if you would take the time, if you like it. If it's a little bit of sex, then you, you, you could do, do us a favor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I have one question. Maybe okay. that's only personal, but... You know, we are so much um, concerned with what is happening in the world with the ISIS and all this very uh, strange and crazy stuff. Yeah. And I, had, I would like to ask you, I mean, this is a book of modern struggle for identity. It has a lot of, lot of labels. It's, uh, yeah. it's only one line. But was that, I mean, you always mention 9-11s. Yeah. And 9-11s, of course, has been a milestone in this whole development which we have now. And that has to be, at least with the adolescent patients we have, it is a longing for simplicity, for orientation in this fundamentalistic thought. And at least I, and we, we we have dealing with adolescent psychoanalysis for a long time. I just don't want to believe that we have neglected this topic so much, that suddenly it is there, you know, this fundamentalistic fascination of a reduction of complexities and this yeah. fascinating. Is yeah. that something you had in mind? With um, well, you know, I think the, the big question for me, I mean, one of the reasons that I've have been a kind of compulsive reader, really. It is a compulsion. But it's um, a good compulsion. Well, okay. But, don't but, but it's don't <laughs> go on a couch and let no, that... But that's, yeah, no, okay. no, but um, I think my analyst would agree. That's not a big... That's not one of my big problems that I read a lot. <laughs> okay. But um, that... Uh, you know, my big question has always been, why do we become who we are or are continue to become whatever it is that we're becoming? I mean, there's so many aspects to this question. Um, is there a kind of single coherent identity? Um, and even if there's not a single coherent identity, which there may well not be, um, what is it that we need as human organisms that have reflective self-consciousness that allows us to pull ourselves together in necessary ways. And, um, you know, violence, 9-11 uh, is, you know, example that's close to me because I was there, um, is extremely difficult uh, to integrate. I mean, there's something about us that rebels. And traumatic memory, of which I have only one, I was in a car accident, I've written about this, and went into shock. But also, I, w I became completely dissociated, you know, and they came and cut me out of the car. And I remember looking out of the car, everything had turned black and white as well. Very interesting. My optic nerve must have been engaged. And I thought, this isn't so bad. 
If I die now, it's not such a bad way to go. You know, I'm terrified of dying. <laughs> Some part of me had to have escaped. And then I had flashbacks four nights in a row. Boom. The accident all over. It was fascinating. I have to say, if I hadn't had it, I wouldn't know what it is. But there is a great example of dissociation and absolutely a tenseless existence. In other words, the car accident isn't behind you. It's not happening. Time and space are completely eliminated, and it's just reenactment again, over and over. And, you know, I'm lucky it went away. It would be awful to live with that for years, as some people do. But this takes us into interesting questions about the neurobiology of the self. What is the self? At what level does the self come into play? Et cetera, et cetera. Yes. And I think you described uh, one example how personal experience is just, un is that English? Yeah. Unvermeidbar. Uh, yes, for, it's for it, it, understanding. Yeah, you can't replicate. You can yeah. you can read about it and read about it and read about it, which I had actually. I had read yeah. a lot about it, and then it happens to you, and it's something else. And I think that's the damn thing of being a psychoanalyst. I think it's true for us to to really understand. You kind of have to have your own experience, and maybe that is another. Uh, secret commonality. Oh yes, have. and I have one thing about this, this is important. The return of the case study, yeah. very, very important to me. I mean, literature and the case have a great deal in common. I know that in the medical school where I now am working, uh, that there are checklists for psychiatrists with their patients. So for example, the uh, psychiatric interns who are in my class are asked, Does the, is the patient capable of insight? Yes, no. <laughs> no. I ask you. Uh, you know, so the, the idea that, you know, that the patient exists as an organism in time, in some kind of dynamic process, even if the physicists tell us there is no time, we subjectively experience time, and we are born and do die. I have to tell you, I'm way into some weird stuff, but, but this, is, this is important, mm. to create a kind of narrative that is co-authored mm. mm. by the patient, and the physician, mm. not just the, you know, the physician up here <laughs> and the patient down here, but some kind of co-authoring narrative that I think it, this is really important in both psychiatry and psychoanalysis. And I think that was one topic of our conference, the rediscovery of good narration and how to kind of keep this as a treasure of psychoanalysis in spite of all the bridges we have to make, but yes. to rediscover the, the richness of the truth of case studies. Yes. yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.